Hey everyone, Father Lane here. It's good to be back with you here on my YouTube channel after some time away. I'm glad to be back to introduce Verbum 10. Uh, the software has just had an upgrade. Today I'm recording this on Sunday, October 16th. The upgrade debuted on Monday, October 10th, so just six days ago. And I thought I'd take this opportunity to show you a little bit about what it can do with the changes with this new version. You can see I just turned on Verbum 10. And one thing you'll notice is that I open to a blank layout. Uh, by way of review, if you go to the program settings, which have been relocated here to the lower left-hand corner, if you go to program settings, it will give you an option to open up to a blank layout or to any number of other layouts. I choose to start with a blank canvas. It just makes it easy for me to start. Once again, we can get rid of the program settings without saving anything. We don't have to save anything. Uh, any changes we make are automatically saved, so we can just hit the X button there. The first thing you'll notice as you open up Verbum 10 is that what used to be scrolled across the top of the screen is now on the left side, and there are a few new options. The favorites menu is a little smaller, but that's okay because you can see we can click on more shortcuts and everything I had saved in Verbum 9 is still here. You can see I have a number of shortcuts that I use. These are resources that I use with regularity. I've also created a lot of my own layouts. You'll notice I minimize the options that the software comes with. I've created all of my own layouts, uh, including all those for my different classes and different kinds of projects that I work on. But what I really want to talk about is how I wrote my Sunday homily this week. Today being a Sunday, it's the 29th Sunday of Ordinary Time in Year C in the Catholic Lectionary. And I want to show you a little bit how I went about writing today's homily. But before I do that, I want to review one very important thing, and that is how to prioritize resources in your library. If you look at some of my other videos, you'll see how to do this in earlier editions of, of Verbum. But here we are, if we go to the library button here, and I like to, when I'm working with my library, hit this button open in a floating window, just makes it easier to work with. I'll even maximize it to give us a little more space. If we go to the vertical three dot menu, you'll see there's this option, prioritize resources. This is fundamental to everything else I'm going to do. So if I hit prioritize resources, you'll see we want to prioritize five different kinds of resources. You can see them on your screen. We want to prioritize Bibles. And I even list, this is especially for the benefit of all of my students here at St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary in Boynton Beach, Florida. But those of you who use the software elsewhere might find these same resources helpful. I always begin with the New American Bible, not because it's the best translation. Certainly that question is intensely debatable, but it's the translation that most resembles what we use at Sunday Mass. So I use it in the classroom for that reason. Then we want to have commentaries. Our St. Vincent de Paul package comes with the Anchor Bible commentary series, as well as the Sacra Pagina and Burrito Lam series. But then we want to have our encyclopedias. Our encyclopedias give us information about the world of the Bible. And so we've got the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, which is a six volume, professional grade, very top flight work even a generation after it was written. And then the 2011 HarperCollins Bible Dictionary is very well respected in the Academy, at least for what it is. It's a one volume work, which can be helpful if you're trying to find out the basics about some topic. You don't want the 60 page exposition of it. Then we have lexicons, which are dictionaries that deal with words, and then all other books. I like to use an analogy when talking about resources. A lot of times, People don't quite get, when we do biblical research, why we want to use different kinds of resources. If I can make an analogy with how we take care of our personal health, if you look at your screen, you've got this pyramid. All of us, hopefully, are trying to live some kind of a healthy lifestyle. We do things like practice good hygiene, practice good diet, get exercise, get enough sleep, the kinds of self-application of healthy habits that we do without a doctor's supervision. That's the base of the pyramid. In the same way, one cannot be a good homilist. One cannot be a good preacher. One cannot be a true minister of the word without regularly reading the Bible. It simply can't happen. That is a fact. There is no substitute for individual experience with the Bible. Just as we have to have healthy habits to live a good physical life, we have to read the Bible in order to be effective ministers of the word, period. That said, 
occasionally situations arise where we need to see a doctor, we need a physical exam, or we're having some illness, we've had some kind of injury, and so usually our first step is to visit our general practitioner. In biblical research, the general practitioner is a commentary. A commentary is going to give you information about any number of different topics that arise in a given book of the Bible. But a commentary you can think of as being like a general practitioner. It gives you general information about the book as a whole. Sometimes, however, as we're trying to preach or we're just doing any kind of research involving the Bible, we have specific questions that require more than a commentary can give us. And that's when we go to a specialist. Just like if you have a heart problem, you need to go to a cardiologist. If you have cancer, you need to go to an oncologist. If you have a skin issue, you need to go to a dermatologist. In biblical studies, if you have a question about some matter of biblical history or archaeology or how society was structured, something involving the history or the culture of the Bible, you want a Bible dictionary for that. In the same way, if you have a question about words, what words meant in the original languages, how words evolved over time, what theological freight different words are carrying, you want to look to a lexicon or to the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament or the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. These resources tell us all about biblical words. And then there are times where we have other questions and we want to do a more specialized study, and that's where other books, monographs, and such are involved. Journal articles are helpful there, too. Anyhow, turning back to our library, you notice I've got my resources prioritized, and I have a few things in my Verbum license because I've been using this software now for years. I've invested a lot of my own money into these resources, so this is my list of preferred resources. When I'm finished working with my library, I hit the X button, and I come back to my blank verbum layout. Now, it's time to preach for the 29th Sunday of Ordinary Time in Year C. I'm going to hit Library, and I'm going to type in Daily Catholic, if I can spell the word Catholic correctly, Readings. And you will see this resource right here is the lectionary. I click on it, and it opens right up to today. And I want to look just for the sake of time, we're going to look straight at the Gospel. So I'm going to click Luke 18, 1 through 8. One other thing that I find helpful is to bring up the Greek. Even if you don't know Greek, it's good to just keep in mind that English is not the original language of the Bible. So I can come to my library, type in NA28, that's the abbreviation for the 28th edition of the Nestle Allen Greek New Testament. That's that one. And what I'll want to do here, I've done this in other videos, you want to make sure you have a link set set. So link set A and link set A. A, so that way when I scroll in one, both will scroll with it. You see like that. Coming back down to chapter 18 here. Another thing I want to do when I come to my visual filters menu, which is this triangular three dot menu, I want to check resource, check corresponding words, hover, same lemma, same root. I want to do that both in English and in Greek. Make sure I've done it. Everything is correct here, so we're done. This is helpful because as I go through the text, I'm going to notice some words here. Like if I check over adversary, you can see in the deep blue, in both English and in Greek, I see the words that are corresponding. Adversary in English translates the Greek word antidiku, the anti-righteous, literally, in Greek. But notice all of these other words that light up in light blue. What this tells me is that all of these words come from the same root, the root for righteousness. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. Before we do that, I want to show you a couple of other things. One of the main characters in this parable is the widow, mentioned here twice. One of the new things about Verbum 10 is that I can use the fact book. The fact book is very, very easy to use now. Uh, they've really upgraded this a lot. If I type in the word widow, I have a number of options. I could, if I wanted, and I already had it up here where I had looked at this beforehand, I could look right at the parable of the unjust judge. But for the sake of discussion, I'm going to click on this, widow, a generic group of people. And what this will do is it will give me all sorts of information about widows. You can see they give, uh, they suggest in the fact book a key article. I find it helpful to scroll through everything once. It is helpful here that they use a number of, they show you some of the related words. If you know some Hebrew or some Greek, you can use this information to know what to look up in the lexicon. But if I scroll through here, you can see there's some media, some other key passages that I might want to examine, different biblical senses. But 
what I'm really going for is what do the dictionaries say? I want to know what widowhood meant in Bible times when St. Luke was writing his gospel. That's a specialist kind of question, so I want a Bible dictionary. And sure enough, the HarperCollins Bible Dictionary, which I had prioritized earlier, here is that article. And it tells me all about how widows lived in a precarious state. You'll notice this is not a particularly long article, but it is very fruitful. God's concern for the plight of widows is revealed throughout the Bible. I ended up mentioning this passage from Psalm 68, father of the fatherless, defender of widows, God and his holy abode, talked about how God's fatherly concern extends especially to orphans and widows because they were particularly vulnerable in the patriarchal society of the Bible. And so I can gain some information here, take some notes. This will inform what I'm going to preach about. Another thing I want to do, going back to that earlier observation I had made about, about all of these words that deal with with uh, with justice, adversary, render a just decision. The unjust judge says, I shall deliver a just decision. Dishonest. This word translated rights. One thing I notice immediately as I read through this is that sometimes we misinterpret this parable to be about saying our prayers, quote unquote, just praying in general. Rather, the parable is not about prayer in general. It's about a specific kind of prayer. Jesus is telling this parable about the necessity for the disciples to pray always without becoming weary. Here he's talking about God securing the rights of his chosen ones. And the insight I had as I was looking at some of these words, this word for chosen ones, eklektos. I can do a Bible word study on that word. And I see immediately chosen, elect, choice. You can see all the ways it's translated here in the New Testament, not particularly frequent in only twice in Luke's gospel, a few times in other gospels. But we're not talking about how God answers any kind of prayer for anyone. Rather, this gospel is talking about how God answers a specific kind of prayer in a specific way for specific persons. And as I do some of the analysis here, as I, I could even, if I wanted here with Chosen Ones, I could scroll down, go to search. Now I'm going to look up any time this word is used, theoretically anywhere in the Greek passages of the Bible. One thing that's important when you're studying a Catholic Bible is that it will include the Deuterocanonicals unless you change it to include only the New Testament, which is what I'm going to do. And indeed, you can see this is not a common theme of ch chosenness, election, at least in the Gospels, but it is mentioned a few times. You can see there's a handful here as I scroll through. So I'm left with the question, what does it mean to be one of God's chosen ones? What does St. Luke mean by that? Notably, he doesn't say. The only other occurrence of this word is in Luke's Passion narrative, where those who are crucifying Jesus are making fun of him. They're sneering, he saved others, let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Messiah of God. So that's not particularly fruitful to helping me know who might the chosen ones be. But we do get a little bit of a hint if we look at the context where, or excuse me, if I scroll down here to the end of this gospel, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And this calls back to how this speech began. If I know my gospel of Luke, Again, there's no substitute for reading the text and reading it carefully. This whole story begins here in verse 20, when Jesus is asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. Who's included in the kingdom of God? If I do a search on that word in Luke's gospel, again, I'm just going to hear I'm only interested in usages of this word that occur in Luke's gospel. There are a few more, and the first one that strikes my attention is this one, Luke 6.20, the Beatitudes. I have a pretty good idea now that the chosen ones the Lord has in mind are those who are blessed fourfold in the Beatitudes, those who are poor, those who are hungry, those who are weeping, those who are hated and excluded and insulted. So that allows me to open up and start structuring my homily 
one of the things I like to do when I'm preaching is to disrupt stereotypical interpretations. A lot of people come to church and they hear this gospel and they think, oh gosh, Father's going to tell us to say our prayers. One of the goals in the introduction, in the first 30 seconds, I as a priest need to convince the congregation to listen to everything else I'm going to say. And one effective way to do that is to disrupt a stereotype, to say, no, that's not what this gospel's about. Rather, this gospel is about how the Lord answers specific prayers in a specific way for specific persons. So therefore, when God does not answer your prayer to make money appear to pay off your credit card debt, we should not be shocked. Or if the Lord does not answer my prayer that the Braves will win the World Series every year, I should not lose faith. Rather, the Lord wants to come close to the poor, to the hungry, the weeping, the hated, the excluded. And so you can see the structure of my homily, reflecting here on the specific kind of answer God is going to give. He's going to provide for the desperate what they need. That's the answer. The specific prayer are those that, in other words, could be expressed as in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need. The widow says, render for me a just decision because I am destitute. Without your help, judge, I can't live. And then the widow, because she is poor, because she is destitute, is one of the chosen ones. And so this invites all of us, as we're praying with this text, to seek to want to be one of those chosen ones, to utter the kind of prayer the Lord answers, and to look for the kind of answer the Lord promises to give. And that invites all of us to look to the Eucharist, as we recognize as Catholics that we're all equally unworthy. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed, and he is delighted to feed us. So this is just a little demo of what Verbum can do. I hope it has been helpful to you. As always, I encourage you to read well and pray well.